You're listening to the Rent Roll Radio Show with Sterling Chapman. Hey, Rent Roll Radio listeners, welcome back to the show. As always, I'm your host, Sterling Chapman. Today, we're joined with a really cool guest that I'm super excited to have on. Um, I've, I've met him at uh, several different conferences over the years, and we're actually we're working with him right now on one of our projects. Dugan Kelly, welcome to the show, and thank you so much for joining us. Hey, Sterling, thanks to be with you uh, and your listeners. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So for our listeners, Dugan is a securities attorney. He is one of the most well-known in, in, in every circle I've run in, um, one of the most well-known uh, security syndication attorneys in the business. So super excited to have him on board. Can you give our listeners a little b- brief background on yourself and how you got into this? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for asking. So um, I'm a I'm a full time attorney. I've been practicing law for over 20 years. Um, I started uh, thinking I was going to stay my entire career in the courtroom. I wanted to be, you know, telling stories and winning big verdicts in front of juries. And I started practicing in Los Angeles um, over 20 years ago. And slowly, as a litigator, you realize that that is the unhappy business. Everybody from being sued, having to sue, being sued, being accused of something, they're not happy. Even if they win, they're still not happy because of the the process that they had to go through. And so I started representing a lot of construction companies, developers, people that had uh, connections to dirt. They were building things. They were putting together deals. They were they were in this world of syndication. So I started learning more about that. And I was always on the risk mitigation side, right? With the pooper scooper and the brush and the broom cleaning up after people on the litigation side. And I thought, what would this look like if I started doing it on the front side and putting deals together and actually seeing people succeed as opposed to having to be sued or being sued? Uh, And so that's how I got into it. And slowly, over a long period of time, my personal practice transitioned almost entirely from litigation to uh, transactional securities, real estate uh, work. And so that's now what I do and have done for a long time for clients all around the United States when they're putting deals together from everything from multifamily to self-storage to mobile home parks to mixed use commercial development all of those types of deals, we provide kind of a, a soup to nuts from acceptance of your LOI all the way to the closing table. And then I now I have other lawyers in my firm that are dealing with the unhappy business and I'm able to deal with just hopefully happy clients. So awesome. that's how I got involved in it. Cool. Can, so can you give a kind of a brief overview of the difference the different type of deals and the different types of relationships and different real estate deals. When is it a syndication? What does it mean that it's a syndication? When is it a joint venture? When do you have to register a security? Can you just kind of give us a brief, you know, history and overview for our listeners that are trying to figure out, you know, how is my money safe? What kind of legal connection are we really making here? Absolutely. That's a great question. I, I often get asked this at conferences around the country from people that are just getting started out and even seasoned uh, operators, syndicators, owners, those terms are used interchangeably with one another. Often wonder what is, when is this a security? And so my rule of thumb is pretty, pretty simple. And that is you're selling a security anytime you as the owner, the operator, the syndicator, the sponsor, you're, you're asking somebody else for money and they are expecting a return on that money. That is the sale of a security. That's often done from the standpoint of where we create a new entity and we sell off pieces of that new entity to passive investors. It does not matter if the passive investor is your mom or your dad, your brother, your sister, your cousin, that crazy Uncle Larry. It doesn't matter. That is the sale of a security. Now, the sale of no, what is not a sale of security? Three buddies get together and they say, hey, we're going to buy a donut shop. 
And we all need to, the, the, the bank is requesting $75,000 in order to get the loan, to get the keys to the donut shop. So each one of you are going to put in $25,000 and you're each going to have an active role in that entity that's owning and operating the donut shop. That's not the sale of a security. That's just your capital contribution to an entity that's going to own and operate. But imagine if one of those buddies said, Hey, I don't want to operate this. I don't have time for that. I always want to be a passive investor. Uh, you two, you, my two other buddies, you own and operate it. I'm going to give you $25,000 and I want, you know, a, a return on that investment. Let's say it's an 8% return on that investment plus my invested capital back when the donut shop sells or when it refinances or, or you get a supplemental loan on that. Now that is a sale of security because that guy went from active to passive. He's now not, doesn't have an active role in that. And so when any time that there's a sale of the securities, it draws in this larger body of law throughout the United States that's governed by the Securities and Exchange Commission. And then aside from the Securities and Exchange Commission that's in Washington, D.C., that has jurisdiction over basically over 27,000 individuals, broker dealers, exchanges, individuals that are selling securities, each state has its own state securities board. And so the reality is all of those boards and the SEC are, are trying to balance the tension between private uh, equity is necessary to fuel the American economy and small business growth and also balance investor protectionism meaning we don't want scam artists and people out there raising money like Bernie Madoff and other people like that, that are taking people's money and they're not, they're not delivering on the promises and they're not engaged in tangible assets. So that's why I'm a big believer in real estate backed securities because it exists and you don't, it's not funny. It's not fuzzy. You can actually drive up and see it if you, if you need to, but that's kind of the difference from a high level sterling, of what's the difference between like a sale of a security. And if, if we just wanted to like do a joint venture, or we just wanted to get together a couple buddies and, and buy something and operate it. So what as a passive investor as one of these limited partners, one of my investors that's coming to me that doesn't know anything about it, what do they need to know that, that you're doing in putting the private placement memorandum as it being a security, what additional protections, um, what would you tell them to make them sleep better at night, knowing that they're not sending money to Bernie Madoff? Yeah. So I tell people always do your due diligence. So people invest with people that they like, know, and trust. Okay. That's bare minimum. That's why you don't see a high conversion rate of people going by a a bus stop and seeing a private offering or investment on the bus bench. And then they call and say, Hey, I want to give this person $75,000. That's ridiculous. So people that think you're going to convert stranger investors to actual investors by the use of slick advertising, I have not found that to be effective. Now, maybe it is somewhere else or with other clients, But I still believe that this is a personal relationship business. So passive investors invest with people they know, like, and trust. And what does that mean? That means that if you're a passive investor and you're looking to invest with somebody, the likelihood is you already know that person significantly well, or you're going to learn about that person, meaning you're going to ask them about their track record. You're going to check their references. You might even have a background check that's run on the particular sponsor. All of those things are things that I coach my passive investor clients to to know about the sponsors, the operators, the people that are putting the deals together. And then I tell clients, high net worth individuals or people that are just investing for the very first time, they need to see certain essential ingredients in every private offering, meaning uh, we need to know what are all the risks associated with possibly investing in this. Where what's the subscription agreement, meaning where's the agreement that legally binds them to sell me a piece of the company and for what amount of money? 
Where's the operating agreement? That's that legally binding agreement that governs what my rights and uh, responsibilities are as a passive investor throughout the life cycle of the asset. And, uh, you know, what, what, uh, who, what's being sold? If all of these ingredients are actually included in the private offering, then it doesn't matter if you're investing in like a, a billion dollar hedge fund or you're doing my donut shop analogy, right? If you're investing in that, the ingredients, maybe not the style, the packaging, the wrapper, if you will, will be different. Uh, lawyers and law firms wrap their offerings in different ways. So the packaging may look different. So stylistically, it may look different, but the information and the ingredients that go into a private offering should be the same. And if they're not there, Sterling, then it's a warning sign. And I tell past investors, it, and I, I get this all the time. Well, the sponsor said that we really, all we have to do is just sign uh, this and we'll get around to the operating agreement once we get up and running. That is silly. That is nonsense. Do not invest in that. Uh, because even if this is your best friend from kindergarten, and you've known him for 35 years, the reality is he cannot control what he does not know. And let's just assume that donut shop, you did a handshake deal, everybody, the past investor threw his money in there, $25,000, and the, and the donut shop uh, tanked. Um, so now, uh, where's your 25 grand? It's lost, never to come back again. And that passive investor now potentially has a claim or could sue the sponsor operator, his friend, for saying, uh, he never told me I could lose my money. In fact, he promised me. He guaranteed me. He told me it was safe. It was take it to the bank. Um, the reality is the disclosures are for both the protection of the sponsors and operators as well as providing vital information to the passive investors. If that's not there, it's a huge uh, warning sign. And, and the same goes for, imagine if you did it without documents or you just gave somebody the $25,000 the, and the property did amazing, but your deal as a passive investor was first money in, first money out, plus 8%. And, and when the, when the donut shop sells, all you get is basically your share of the profits. You don't get that 8%. And you say, where's my 8% on my money? And they say, what are you talking about? They say, that was the deal. And they say, that wasn't the deal. What are you talking about? So the, the law is there and the securities law it may sound complicated, may seem complicated, but at its essence, it really shouldn't be, right? Don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, and disclose. Um, I, if you I, can I, do those I always things, say it's, it's intuitive, like plumbing. <laughs> that's exactly right. You got it. We're the, we're the plumbers in the, in the deal. That's, that's why, unfortunately, you always need a plumber. Uh, you always need a lawyer in connection with the sale of security. Awesome. So I, if I'm understanding you correctly, basically a syndication or when you buy or, you know, a, a large apartment complex or a self-storage facility or mobile home park, and you have these operators and you have these passive investors and together, and basically the operator is forming an LLC or they're forming a business entity and they're selling shares off to the limited partners, right? You got it. So what differentiates that process from Apple starting a company and selling off their shares. What's the differentiator there? Yeah. So the vast majority of deals in the United States are done privately. That's not surreptitious. It's not, it's not weird or illegal or whatever. These are what we call private offerings, meaning they are done privately. They are not registered on an exchange. So like IBM, Apple, um, you name it, uh, uh, big fortune 500 companies, their stock is sold, bought and sold and offered for sale on a national exchange. The New York stock exchange is the most famous example, right? 
I can go look at the New York Stock Exchange and I can buy pieces of public companies. That's not what we're talking about. The vast majority of deals that are put together in the United States today, certainly in the commercial real estate space, are done in private offerings. That means that somebody, the sponsor, which is the operator or the syndicator, is creating an entity. Most often that entity is a limited liability company, but sometimes for taxation purposes or if they have foreign investors, it might be a limited partner. That new entity exists, and that is what is sold privately around to passive investors. And so at the conclusion of that, whenever the first sale takes place, uh, there's what's called a simple notice filing. It's called a Form D that's filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission that advises them that you have engaged in a private offering. It doesn't ask for their blessing. It doesn't ask for the permission. But you're providing a notice, a simple notice filing in, in with the SEC, as well as any state in which an investor lives or resides that's participating in your offering. And those are called blue sky filings. But aside from those filings, that deal is largely private. That's why, as a passive investor, it's so important that those essential ingredients, that you see those essential ingredients for your protection that are included in that private offering. And when we say private offering or a PPM, those are basically the same. And a PPM is just a, a word. It's called a private placement it just means that there's a lot of, of, of smaller legal documents included inside of this process. And, that it, and that's everything from risks, disclosures, blue sky, operating agreement, subscription agreement, uh, investor questionnaires to try to figure out if this is suitable. And most importantly, the operating agreement that will govern the entity that you just paid your $25,000 to get a piece of. Those are the ingredients that you want to see, but it's all done privately. So like what Sterling said, if you're going to potentially buy a share of Apple, you're doing that publicly. You're buying a piece of a public company. You're not buying a piece of a public company in a private offering. You're buying a piece of a private company in a, in a private offering. And if we look at just a snapshot and this is just my opinion, but I, the statistics that I've seen over a 20-year period, the returns in the private offering space have doubled that if, as if you were buying in the public space. So that's why you see a lot of investors, both uh, new investors as well as seasoned investors, buying private placements because the returns are significantly better. Now the risks are more, right? Because without risk, there is really no profit. So you have to understand really um, the risks and the business plan associated with what the company is that you're investing into. But the rewards, the potential returns are significantly larger in the private offering space than they have uh, historically in the public space. Absolutely. I think we've all seen that over and over again. Can you talk a little bit about the regulation D and the, the two subset different types of offerings? Absolutely. So reg D, uh, most of the commercial, uh, offerings around the country, not all because there's reg S and there's reg CF and there's all sorts of other regulations, but most of the commercial syndication and multifamily self-storage mobile home park, those sorts of offerings are in what we call rule 506 regulation D the, of the SEC. And what that, and, and there are two subsets inside that reg D there are in, in the rule 506, there's 506 B and 506 C offerings. 506 C offerings uh, really came um, online in around 2013 with the passage of the Jobs Act under President Obama. President Obama uh, thought it was uh, needed for the ability of operators to do something that historically they were prevented from doing, and that was advertising. So, so uh, historically, advertising or what, what the SEC calls general solicitation, meaning going to somebody that you don't know, 
presenting them with the opportunity to invest into your deal, that uh, was frowned upon. It was prohibited. It's not appropriate. It's non-compliant with current regs. Well, in 2013, that, that changed. It was earth shaking for those of us that are in the securities business. That was a massive shift. And so what it did is now you have the historical rule, which is 506 B B I usually tell people stands for buddies because most people, when they put together a private offering, their, their primary target is people that they know, like, and trust, right? Their family members, their buddies. And the SEC says you on 506 B no advertising. That's the historical rule, but you can have up to 35, 35, what the SEC calls sophisticated investors invest into your offering. Uh, and, and not, so not all of your investors have to be what the SEC calls accredited investors. These are individuals and accredited investor most often, and for your purposes, is somebody whose net worth is north of a million dollars, backing out the primary value of their primary residence. So you think about that. If the primary asset that I own is my home and I can't use that for my net worth criteria, well, then a lot of people potentially don't have a net worth of a million dollars. And the SEC says, we want, if you're going to use net worth as the criteria for whether they're accredited or not, we want their net worth to be something north of a million dollars or that they've made $200,000 or $300,000 combining their spouse's income together in the last two taxable years with a reasonable expectation that they will achieve that same level of income in this taxable year. So if they fell into that camp in 506B, Fantastic. They can invest into your offering, or if you know them and they have a certain level of business acumen and can understand the merits and risks associated with the transaction such that they fall into that sophisticated camp, you can have 35 of those. Now that's 506 B. That's what most people do. Understandably so, because most of us, the, in our Rolodex, right? are not accredited investors. Now, what the government and the SEC, President Obama said is, hey, listen, if you want to advertise, you no longer can do 35 sophisticated investors. Now you have to be straight up all accredited investors and you can't just take their word for it. Well, why? Why can't I just take their word for it? Well, because you may not know that. If you're advertising, the likelihood is they're a stranger to you and you can't just take their word for it. They can't just self-certify or self-verify that they're an accredited investor or even a sophisticated investor. They actually have to be independently verified as an accredited investor, right? Well, how do I do that? Well, the reality is there's lots of ways in which you can independently verify the easiest and best way is if the investor's lawyer or the investor's certified public accountant sends you a letter and says, hey, this person is an accredited investor. Why? Because I've read all of their tax returns or I know them and this is their net worth based on their bank account and all this stuff. Well, that's the best. If you can get a letter uh, because it's the easiest, right? And you don't have to, to do that. Other people can't do that, or investors may not, their CPAs may be unwilling to do that. Their lawyers may be unwilling to do that. It may be cost prohibitive. There's lots of different factors that, uh, so you'll see investors that are outsourced to other companies that potentially will provide that as a service uh, to people. So I think, um, uh, and then, uh, and then lastly, I've got lots of uh, sponsors, operators that will take that upon themselves and they'll actually have the investors send them the information. They'll pour over it and they'll make a determination and they'll have that material such that if their deal was audited or, or looked at, they can demonstrate the independent verification of the actual investor. Uh, and so that's very important. Those key distinctions between why would I tend to go 506B or 506C and and so people are making choices in connection with that. So on that topic, I just have one comment before I want to dive a little deeper into the B. Um, 
my partners are in New York City and I'm in South Louisiana and they're always pushing to do a a C because everybody they know is accredited anyway. And I always give them the pushback and say, look, I know in New York City they pay the dog walkers 200 grand a year, <laughs> but down here in South Louisiana, right. most people aren't walking around as millionaires. But um, I wanted to dive a little deeper into the the B. Um I have two main questions I'd, I'd like you to answer. I'm just going to spit them out so I don't forget. Um, the first one is what qualifies you as a having as a buddy, as you say, or having a pre-existing relationship. I see a lot of operators that um, that advertise them, themselves, not their deals, but they'll, you know, a, as we all want to market ourselves and, and they'll schedule a 15 minute call and, and they'll, you know, chat it up and exchange some emails and then they're on the B list. Is that, uh, is that okay? Or is that, is that really walking a fine line, borderline getting in trouble? I'm just, I'm curious. Yeah, I, I, I mean, so the SEC doesn't say they don't give us a clear uh, delineation of like, you have to have three coffees and two dinners with somebody right. until they're now they're in your network. Now you have a preexisting substantial relationship with them. The key is really, uh, that under 506B, you can't engage in general solicitation. Well, um, does that mean that I can't talk to my friends or my relatives or people that I've known for a long time or really know about my deal? Uh, no, it doesn't mean that because the SEC made a carve out. The SEC says it is not general solicitation if you talk to people that you have a pre existing substantial relationship with about your deal. Okay, great. How do I get a pre-existing substantial relationship with somebody that I just met? And how long does it take? But well, we used to think that there was a magic time frame. We used to think historically that it was like 30 days or something. And the SEC says, no, it's not form over substance. It's substance over form, meaning you need to have high quality engagement and relational um, uh um, engagement with this potential individual such that you Sterling as the sponsor operator could say this person, I just met them, uh, John, right. I just met John and I've, I've had a bunch of conversations with John about his investment philosophy, what he's previously done, what he does for a living, what his liquidity looks like, what his net worth potential looks like, what he's looking to invest in, all of those types of things, just a historical kind of track record. And the question really is going to be, Sterling, do you know enough about John such that you would say, John, understands the merits of potentially investing in a deal, but more importantly, understands the risks associated uh, in the deal. And two, does John uh, intend to buy for his own account, meaning he intends to buy it for himself, or is he uh, seeking to flip this? This is not a, you know, this is not like HGTV where we're buying and fixing and flipping. Uh, in the securities arena, these are illiquid assets. We want investors to understand there is not a secondary market within which you can just trade this. Yeah. Uh, and there's a mandatory holding period. So if they're buying it for their own account, which is the words that they use. Uh, and then lastly, could John withstand the total loss of his investment? So if he gave you $25,000, is he now going to be on food stamps or EBT or right. you take, you know, you name it all around the country. Is he going to be, have to be relying on government subsidies or assistance, or is that going to make a major hit to uh, his ability to function and provide for himself or his family? If the answer to that is yes, it is what we call not suitable for him to invest in your deal. If the answer is no, then you have sufficient information such that that person is now within your network and you have a substantial uh, pre-existing relationship with that person. And so the time frame really is up to you and up to the investor. If that happens in a very short period of time within which you can learn about that person and they can learn about you and uh, you can, you can develop that relationship. Great. If it takes a very long time, then 
Great. So the SEC really looks at the at the substance of it, not just the form, right? Does it pass the smell test, right? As your mom used to tell you, uh, if it doesn't, then it's not suitable, and you shouldn't be offering uh, offering it to them. But that's that's really what I tell people as how you have to develop that relationship. Awesome. The other question I have about the five hundred six B is me as an operator. Uh, I know we're prohibited from um, from solicitation and advertisement, but I, I feel like uh, some folks, including myself, get kind of paranoid and carried away with it. You know, if I if I'm closing on a property in Atlanta next month and I'm going to visit my property and do due diligence, but it's a 506B offering, I have zero intention of taking money from anybody I didn't know before. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been advised in the past, like, don't even check in on Facebook that you're in Atlanta. Don't, you know what I mean? And, 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 you know, outside of funding that particular deal, I I like to have a continual marketing going on for my business and to raise my awareness in general. So like, what, what could I get away with? I mean, without, you know, crossing the line there. There's a lot of paranoia out in the marketplace. Um, Understandably so. You know, does he? Uh, well, there's there's two extremes, right? There's the one extreme of like, oh my gosh, if I say anything on Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn about my business, the services that it provides, uh, I'm guilty and I'm going to go to jail. That's silliness. That is ridiculous. That's one extreme. The other extreme is. Um, the other extreme is I can say anything I want on, uh, this and I can put at the bottom of my, um, LinkedIn profile, please call me to invest today, you know, and then you can receive a 10% cash on cash return on an annual basis for my deal. That's the other extreme. Oh, hell no. Who's going to do that? No, we don't want anybody doing that. That's ridiculous. The reality is the SEC does not want you to, to engage in what we call preconditioning the market. So again, remember, does this pass the smell test? And most of you know, like in your gut, if what you're doing and you're putting as you're plunking away and you're about ready to push send and you're pushing out to your 3000 BFS on Facebook, if what you're saying is really designed to motivate people to invest with you, if that is the the key, if that's what you're trying to do, well, then the SEC says that's not appropriate. Well, what what what? I mean, obviously, that's what I'm trying to do, but not for this particular deal. And that that's okay if that's what I'm trying to do for the future. Well, what you're tr- what what you should be trying to do is engage in a prudent evangelism of the 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 services and the business that you have without um, uh, referencing or trying to design or, or drive traffic to you for a particular offering. So, okay. so the general prohibition on solicitation is tied to the sale of securities. It is not tied to the, to the promotion of or the, the prudent um, uh, advertising of a business that provides uh, services. So if you're, you know, so the reality is there's a fine line. I agree. There has to be a tension there that exists. And, and it's, it's one of those gray areas that has existed for a long time. And that is you have to find a way in which you can tell people factual information about your business and provide content, content that's uh, specific and factual without getting into uh, deal specific information that is tied to your specific offering. And so you wouldn't want to say, I have a, a property that I'm in the presence of syndicating. I'm there to do due diligence on it. Please call me if you want to know more about this opportunity. So what about this? If I just met somebody, this, this happens a lot. Um, I have an, I have investors that I've known for a long time and we have a good deal, but we're about to close and, and, they go, Hey, my friends want to get in. And my response is always, well, I I can't take your friends on this one 
but I would love to meet them and get to know them so that they can invest with me in the future. And let's send them the deal so they can see what my work looks like, what kind of prize an example, although I won't take their money this, this go round. Uh, I would not trouble there. I would not send an active deal to somebody that you don't have, that you don't have a pre-existing relationship with until after the deal closes, meaning the, okay. the, the raise is closed and there's no possibility of anybody else, whether it's somebody that you knew or whatever is coming in. And the reason why is because these are private uh, placements. These are, these are meant to be private. Obviously um, if if you, if those friends, let's say unbeknownst to you, one of the investors in your deal gave, gave it to somebody else. And so they got their hands on it. You know, obviously you want to develop a pre-existing relationship with those people before they invest in your deal. And so that's the whole reason why I think Facebook is an amazing medium for groups and private groups and, and closed groups to be able to get together to talk about what they're passionate about, commercial real estate being one. Meetups are another way. Your website, lots of different ways, creating podcasts, creating original creative content for people to get uh, the word out to, to people about what you're interested in and connect with like-minded individuals. All of that is fine. There's no, there's no issues with that. Where you cross the line is, um, in my opinion, is when um, the content or the context of your of your the communication, regardless of the medium or the forum or the mechanism of delivery, uh, is really designed to drive an investor to you for a particular sale of securities. And so the SEC says, you know, obviously we want we want to balance the ability for you, Sterling, to make money, to engage in private equity. All of these things are amazing opportunities, blessings, and they drive job growth, uh, revitalization for uh, a lot of times communities that haven't seen, um, you know, injection of private equity inside their own communities and opportunities for passive investors to get into the game. This game used to be historically only for the richest of the rich, for the richest families in the country, for the biggest corporations in the, in the country. That's no longer the case. And so you don't have to be, your last name doesn't have to be Rockefeller or whatever Vanderbilt for you to be able to invest into private real estate. It really should be regardless of your background, your ethnicity, where you came from. um, It should be for everybody. As long as you're able to balance that tension between investor protectionism, as well as disclosure of the risks and then the merits associated with your offering. Awesome. 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 Anything else for our, our listeners before we shoot over to the radio round? I don't think so. I'm just excited. I get excited. I get it. I get excited because I love the fact that people like yourself have a purpose, a missional, you're almost missional and purpose in spreading the great news of what's going on in the commercial real estate space. So I think it's something that everybody should know certainly has benefited um, uh, my parents, my family, that's allowed them to provide for themselves, put food on the table for, for decades. And so I really think uh, if you're not active in looking at deals or investing in deals, you really should be from a, from, from a, a passive investor's point of view. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't have said it better myself. Um, so real quick for our radio round, uh, we just have three quick questions to help our listeners get to know you a little bit better. The first one is what's your favorite book? My favorite book. Well, I am an avid reader, love to consume content. Uh, unfortunately I read all the time, uh, as a lawyer as well, sure. but, but every book, a book that I read fairly regularly, like every year or every other year is think and grow rich by Napoleon Hill. Love and 
A lot of people probably say that on your program. I don't know, but it's a, it's a big book in the, certainly in the real estate um, uh, business, but the important aspect for me is this mindset. You have to have a positive mindset. If you're going into investing or anything in life and you have a negative mindset that will impact your work ethic and your ability to succeed, in my opinion. So you always have to have a, a positive, uh, uplifting mindset. And hopefully that's infectious because that will continue to spread, you know, pay it forward, so to speak, for you and for others. Yeah, that that's an amazing book. And, it, and it's kind of like the, the fundamental foundation of all of the other personal development, Tony Robbins, Jim Rohn stuff that's come out, you know, in the last 70 years. Uh, I actually read that book long before I ever heard or started investing in real estate when I was in corporate America and, and, and considered it to be the, my driving success there. Wow. Those I didn't know those, that. those principles can be applied in, in any industry, you know, wherever you are, the book doesn't have anything to do with real estate, but uh -huh. um, the real estate entrepreneur, certainly without the structure of corporate America telling them, Hey, run at this speed on this treadmill, you know, there, there is certainly um, a, a larger demand for a strong mindset to persevere through a lot of what is uncharted territories without, you know, a, a rule book. Absolutely. Couldn't agree with you more, brother. I think it's it, having a positive mindset that book's been around for over a hundred years. So it's just, it's something that we could all learn to uh, take nuggets in that and apply to our daily lives, regardless of whether you're involved in real estate or not. Yeah. What's your, uh, what's your favorite quote? So I'm going to lift this up just a little bit. See that right behind me right there. Yeah. That is it. I hang it on my wall. I see it every day. Uh, it reminds me about work, work ethics. So the quote, if you can see that, I get my head out of the way. Everyone wants to eat, but few are willing to hunt. And the reality is that a uh, work ethic in the practice of law or investing being an operator, or even being a passive investor, don't procrastinate. So you might think, man, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to whatever. I'm like, get off your derriere and actually do it. The biggest deal killer, both from, uh, from being practicing in law or any industry investing or, um, uh, being an operator in my opinion is procrastination. And so now I'm not saying don't do your <laughs> your due diligence or scatter your seeds everywhere possible. The reality is you just need to be prudent, be a good steward, but in being a good steward of the blessings that you have been given, you need to sow, you need to sow and you actually need to plant seed and you need to invest. And if you're not doing that, then in my opinion, you're not being a good steward of some of the resources that you have and, um, and so that's why I have that quote hanging up, uh, on my wall. Absolutely. Love it. Love it. Um, what's your favorite thing to do outside of work? I spend time with my family. So I love my, I have a wife that I've been married for over 20 years. Um, and I've got three children, uh, three boys actually, Oh, wow. The oldest is almost out of high school. And so um, he's into certain things and I've got one that's kind of going into high school. And so he's into different certain things. And then I've got uh, one that's still in middle school and hasn't, hasn't uh, gotten out of that yet. So I spend time with my wife and my family. Uh, we'll go to church, uh, lots of different things around uh, where we live, but um, family is, is the most important thing to me. It's more important than what I do. Um, uh, you know, it's why you do what you do. That is most definitely why I do what I do is for my, for my family. Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. I have, uh, I have two young boys and they're, uh, they're about 18 months apart. I, I've always wanted three. I'm the baby of three boys. But man, that those those two those two in diapers at the same time they've got me uh, pumping that's the brakes a, a bit. <laughs> that's a very hard time, and it's really hard on mom. Uh, I'm yeah. so so grateful to Michelle. That's my wife. She 
for all everything that she's done for our family, the sacrifices that she has made. She's actually went to law school and she has sacrificed to be able to um, uh, help take care of our children, which is, is something that I'm not sure I can do. Like the, there's no way that can crack you quite quick. Like your kids, like psychologically. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm super grateful. Very, 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 very grateful. I couldn't agree more. And I don't uh, communicate that enough to my wife, but yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't do it. You need she, to, man. You need to, you need to try to remember. It's always a good thing for us whether you're, whether you're working outside of the home, whether you're a man or woman or whatever, if your spouse is at, uh, is at the house and they are personally sacrificing for, for you or for your family, it's always important to take note of that or remind ourselves. And if we, if we don't remember, have our friends help remind us that, yeah, uh, we got to take care of that for sure. I, when she recently gave up her career to stay home with the boys. And I, I remember going, are you sure? Yeah. Like, don't get me wrong. My life's going to be easier, but yours isn't. Right. <laughs> that's, oh. that's right. It, it's, it is a, like I said, I'm not sure. Um, I'd like to think that I, that I could do that. And I know some, some guy friends that I, that um, could easily do it uh, just because of the way they're, they're wired. And I'm like, I just, I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm, really, I'm really not sure, but I know that I'm so grateful uh, to, to my wife for her ability and her mindset and just her tenacity in the way that she has cared for um, the, that aspect of our family for sure. Awesome. Absolutely. How can our listeners uh, get in touch with you, find out more about you, uh, learn from you, hire you? Oh man, thank you so much. We're, uh, I'm always interested in speaking with anybody around the country. We uh, thankfully I've got a unique name. Uh, so you can Google foo me. Uh, it's Dugan. Uh, and, uh, we're, we're in, uh, Santa Barbara, California. We're also in Dallas, Texas. That's where our main offices are. And you can just find us on the internet, uh, shoot me an email, uh, call our office, set up a consultation, happy to chat with anybody. We've got a YouTube channel that we're trying to crank out as much content as we can just to help facilitate, um, listeners and, and people that are trying to get involved in, in commercial real estate, but that's how you can get a hold of me. Easy. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining. I think this was probably the most informative interview we've done. And I think this is our 119th interview. So oh my gosh. I am sure. um, I am very grateful for, for you joining us and for sharing all of your, your wisdom with us. Uh, I look forward to seeing you. I'm sure I'll see you either at the Multifamily Investor Network on the 12th in Houston or the um, the best ever conference at the end of February. You will see me at both places looking so forward to it absolutely thank you so much and i look forward to uh to working with you on our journey thank you thanks for tuning in to the rent roll radio show brought to you by crestworth capital we hope you enjoyed the show and if you did please hit the subscribe button and leave us a rating and review you can also visit us at crestworthcapital.com or rentrollradio.com or follow us on Facebook at Rent Roll Radio or at Crestworth Capital. If you would like to reach us, feel free to shoot us an email at info at rentrollradio.com or sterling at crestworthcapital.com. We hope you come back next week to join us on some more of our journey. Until then, happy investing.